And we are live. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matthew Kressel. I co-host the series with Ellen Datlow. Tonight's guests are Karen Lord and AC Wise. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're, we always open up a little bit early just to kind of relax and uh, open the bar, so to speak. So hang out, grab a drink, grab a seat. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah. You're welcome. So if you hear a sound in the background, those are tree frogs. Yes. <laughs> my air with Karen in Barbados right now. Mm -hmm. So lower my air conditioner. It uh, adds a nice atmosphere, I think. It's it's the nightlife sound, definitely. <laughs> yes. And hello, Mansamu. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. So yeah, this is what this is our. Um, our 18th, our 18th live stream. Yeah, Isn't that insane? So it is a year and a half already. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I kind of like it. At least I don't have to go off at KGB and hang out. You know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I miss seeing everybody in person. Oh, and I so. hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what's great about this, you know, we say this every month, is that we, we get to invite people from all over the world that couldn't normally make it. And um, I mean, that's the best part. And then people all obviously can watch it live uh, from all over the world too, or not live or recorded. Oh, hi, Sam. I didn't, yeah. I, I know you. I mean, at least- Oh, I hi, know. Sam. Yes, I know you as well. And hi, Amy. Well, I'm sure there'll be a Corgi, right? AC, you have Corgis? <laughs> at least one Corgi encounter this evening. <laughs> I have two Corgis, but they've been banished from this room. So you want to, okay. unless they break in, Amy. Yeah, unfortunately, well, you might hear a Corgi barking in the background, but they won't make an actual appearance. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, all right. Hi, Joseph. Yes, hello, Joseph. So yeah, 18 months, it's kind of crazy. Um, I won't uh, actually be here next month. Uh, I'll be at my family's for, for Yom Kippur. I haven't uh, really seen them in a while for, you know, because of the pandemic. Um, Who's gonna do it? Is Raj gonna do it? Uh, Eugene Myers, EC Myers is gonna oh, do it. Uh, yeah, he's he's, uh, he's good. good. Um, and yeah, he'll be he'll be doing that. Um, I'll miss I'll miss it. Um, but then next month, October, we're gonna be live. I mean, in person, mm -hmm. uh, back at the bar. So right. that'll be interesting. Um, and also, we have a special one. Don't forget, September twenty first. There's gonna be a special one that. Um, for uh, reading from when things get dark, my Shirley Jackson anthology. Mm. Yeah, so it's a special reading. It's it's um, separate from the fantastic fiction right. series, but um, we're using like the same uh, template or whatever. You same, call it. yeah, template. So it'll be on on this YouTube channel. If you uh, if you can, please like and subscribe. It helps uh, YouTube's algorithm find us. So when you search for stuff. If you like it and you subscribe, we're more likely to show up, and then, uh, yeah, other people can can see great work. Well, Ellen seems to have left the building. That's all right. <laughs> That's fine. So, uh, yeah. So it's just seven o'clock sharp. If you're just joining us, it's fantastic fiction at KGB. Uh, if you've never seen this before. This is uh, a monthly reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month. It's been going for oh, over over two decades. So uh, it's it's been a long, fun ride, also a little crazy the past uh, year and a half or so. But uh, yeah, it's we're, we're glad to be able to, to still do it. I, we're going to try to figure out some way to record the readings when we're in person, but I don't think we're going to do it live. There's just too many logistics to do it in a crowded bar with, you know, then I'd have to deal with, you know, um, you know, cutting, cutting it out, like when, during the breaks and, and things like that, we don't want anyone to get on mics, you know. While Amy, when's your birthday? Doing a reading on your birthday. When is your birthday, Amy? Amy asks, you're doing a reading on your birthday. Which Very is nice. And what date is that? She'll tell us in a second. There's a little bit. Like, like, yeah. By the way, I realize I'm going to be missing in May. I'll be looking. I'll be in. That's the day I leave for Italy. All right. September 21st. Yeah. 
Oh, and that's the day the book comes out too. Well, happy early birthday. Uh, so tonight's guests are uh, Karen Lord and AC Wise. Um, let's see, Karen's gonna read first and then Allison's gonna read second. And uh, afterwards we're gonna do a Q and A with the authors. So if you have questions you'd like to ask them, please uh, start thinking of them now. Um, also their books are available. So let me uh, make use of the fancy fancy thing here. Uh, we have Unraveling by Karen Lord and Wendy Darling by AC Wise. And if you look in the, down there in the, in the YouTube description, you can see the uh, links to get the books. Uh, it links to Amazon, but if you have a uh, preferred bookstore, you just search for them. Um, so please support the authors and get the books. Um, also- um, well, We're not, st are we starting already? No. I'm still just talking. We don't. I mean, I don't have to do the, the spiel yet. We can we can hang out <laughs> because you're doing the spiel. I don't. Yeah, I just I just kind of fell into it. But, but yeah, I don't. Okay, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go. Keep I'm just rolling into it. It's fine. Okay. So, all I'm, I was just going to say that uh, you know, if you can support the KGB bar itself, um, that would be awesome. You know, they they uh, really took a hit during the pandemic. Uh, with I mean, everybody did. Um, so you can support them with a little donation there. Um, and they also were uh, burgled. Um, oh, no. So, yeah. yeah, someone broke the door down and stole some uh, memorabilia. Uh, what, power, what would you call it? Uh, pitch? The Soviet yeah. Union memorabilia. Yeah, so wow. like, <laughs> yeah, like the bar is, is Soviet themed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it's like supposed yeah. to be like, um, like ironic or they really support that I, don't, I never quite figured that out but uh yeah they had some like original stuff from the Soviet union like mm. like lenin statues and pictures of like you know uh you know various socialist leagues and things like that and uh just original stuff and that that was uh, some of it was stolen although i did see that the the lenin statue was still at the bar so. do they have an outside do they have a shed outside no they set it up in front of the thing I think it was kind of it sounded really planned. It looked like a bus stop. It did not well, look like Well also, did, I mean the weird thing was um that they wanted to do readings out there. It's like how can you do readings outside in the middle of traffic? Yeah, there's like <laughs> sidewalk there. It's like, just, and there's no we don't want to do that, thank you. But we'll come back <laughs> when, you know when we're inside again. <laughs> yeah. So uh yes, Matt S, it was BS. Who does crap like that? Well, yeah. It was I, unfortunately. Sure. So, but uh, yeah, Karen's joining us from Barbados and AC Wise is joining us from Philly, did you say? Yep. Philly, yeah. Philly suburbs. Philly <laughs> suburbs. So, uh, yeah, we're excited to uh, again bring people in who may not normally have been able to get to New York. Um, which is which is great. So like we've had guests from South Africa, Australia, uh, UK, Pakistan, Barbados. Now where else? Um, have we had anyone from South America yet? No. No. I don't know many writers here. Yeah. Well. And we haven't had anyone. Well, it's from South Africa, but not from any other African country. Uh, right. Yeah. Oh, and the sound you hear? <laughs> a tree, tree frog? What are they called? Tree frogs. <laughs> tree frogs from Barbados. If you can listen, you hear that sound in the background? That's Karen. <laughs> it's accompanying Karen's. It's going to be. It's going to be accompanying Karen's reading. <laughs> and I and I have a first line that is perfectly apt for the for the sound as well. Oh, good. Great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it looks like I'm the only one drinking. <laughs> what do you drink? Cool. What do you like? A beer? A beer? What kind? It's called Minky Boodle, I guess. <laughs> um, it's a raspberry sour. It's quite good, actually. Yeah. I'm sorry. It sounds terrible. 
I mean, I mean, Berlin of Weisse to me is the worst beer. It's like yeah, I mean, things beer. have come a long way since Berlin of Weisse. Really? So it doesn't yeah. taste like that. It's not sweet. No, I mean, it's it's tart, but it's not sweet. No, tart's good. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't know if I can drink beer. I haven't tried drinking beer yet. Right. <laughs> So okay. yeah. Well, we still have. We'll start and maybe my. Starting about th three minutes. My watch is seven ten, but my computer says seven oh seven. What do you it's want? About, it's about seven oh seven. All right, I'll change my watch. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I like to have it as accurate as possible. Amy, you had a, an hibiscus sour oh. earlier tonight. I don't think I've ever had an hibiscus sour. Or maybe I did. Who? Oh, oh. What is that like? Is that a beer or is that a drink? Like a whiskey sour, Amy. What is that? I think that's a beer. Oh, thank you, thank you, um, Simon. <laughs> Sam, I mean. Ah, uh, Avi Kotzer is from South America. Now he's in Spain. Okay. Helena in Williamsburg has amazing sours. Okay, I have to check that out. That's what Amy says. I'll put that up here. I like I, beers. I, I like didn't that place, but I'll try. Or beers, I like, like, um, like that Baltica. You know, like um, what? what is <laughs> Islander. <laughs> what are the real dark ones called? Um, like Guinness, but not Guinness. I hate like Guinness. a stout or a no, porter. Porter. I love porters, but not Guinness. I hate Guinness. It's too flat. I like a really. I've had porters that tasted almost like. Um, Port, almost like you know, wine. It was, I mean, it was incredible. Um, I don't even remember, you know, that's the kind of porter I actually like. That's yeah, cool. Pickering and Undertow. Oh, hi, hello, hello from Pickering and Undertow Publications. Hi, Caroline. What is Pickering? Yeah, I know Undertow. I'm not sure if I'm familiar. Yeah, is that a different publisher or connected somehow to Undertow? <clears throat> Linda, I didn't know you grew up in Philly. I mean, Philly represent, yes. <laughs> uh, <We're opening. laughs> so, uh, if you're just tuning in, tonight's guests are Karen Lord and AC Wise. Here are their books. Check them out, please. Buy them. Um, buy them, yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> That would be awesome if you did that. By the way, Amy, I still have a picture of your Stein from last month. Oh, Pickering is in Toronto. Here's the Stein that. Ouch. <laughs> oh, calamity. <laughs> a calamity, yeah. right? Oh, you got the beer Stein. I didn't. Yeah, I got a bowl. I got um, I got a set of four, you know, like soup bowls, deep ones. I mean, they had gotten the uh, calamity where I had flat ones, which I didn't like, but they can't have put enough soup in them for flat bowls. But they got, they did, he did four um, kind of what I could consider soup bowls. <clears throat> and I really like them. Okay, Pickering is a city outside of uh, Toronto. I thought it was that. Linda says, uh, oh, yes, graduated from Germantown High School. Amy, you finished only a beer already? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's about 10 after, so we should probably get started. Mm -hmm. um, you're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. I'm Matthew Kressel. I co-host the series with Ellen Datlow. Tonight's guests are Karen Lord and AC Wise. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, this is like we were saying before, this is our 18th month doing it live. We're back in the bar in October. Um, hopefully everything is gonna be okay then. There's a Delta variant coming back right now, which is not mm -hmm. so great. Um, but our plan is to be back in October. Um, we're going to do some kind of recording video, but not sure exactly how that's going to play out yet. Um, if you can, please support the KGB bar, uh, the actual bar, the physical bar, the, the background picture there that you see is from the bar, uh, by donating uh, here, the link at the bottom there. And uh, the series itself, so uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB started in like the late 90s been going yeah like over two decades uh ellen and i have been hosting it together for over a decade and uh 
you know, it costs a little bit of money to run. Um, so if you can support us, that would be really great. Our, we did a Kickstarter, I think it was, like three, four years ago. More than that, wasn't it? When was it it's like coming up on four years, I think. And we're starting to run, we're, like we're, we're, we're running out of money. So if you can, that would be awesome. If, if not, don't worry about it. But if you can, we really, really appreciate it. And some of you have already donated. Kickstarter. Yeah, I don't want to do another Kickstarter. <laughs> another Kickstarter. Please, no, no. Um, some of you have already donated, and uh, thank you. You are, thank you, and and some of you have been extremely generous. So yeah, we, I mean, basically, we we give the authors a small amount of stipend each, and we and when we are in person, we take them out to dinner afterwards. And also, there's a small fee for uh, Streamyard to keep it running each month, and we've been giving the bar. Um, a donation every month just to keep it going because you know we would bring business into the bar we do the reading there but uh yeah so enough of that let's get on to our guests right mm -hmm. um so our first reader tonight is going to be karen lord uh karen uh, barbadian writer karen lord is the award-winning author of redemption and in indigo the best of all possible worlds the galaxy game and unraveling and the editor of the anthology new worlds Old Ways, Speculative Tales from the Caribbean. Here's Karen Lord. Thank you so much, Matthew. So first of all, hello to everyone. I'm seeing some familiar names in the comment section. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of reading from Unraveling, just the beginning and the end. It's one of three selections, um, three different works I'm going to be reading from today. So let us begin. A chorus of tree frogs trilled in the damp velvet darkness, wide awake and relentless as they spoke their authority over the nocturnal world. The village of Makenda slowly marked the hours to midnight with a quieting of laughter and argument, a dimming and darkening, and a staccato punctuation of ending sounds, the shutting of doors, the dropping of shoes, and the weighty hush of a house empty of talk but filled of dreaming. One house kept vigil with a single glowing window. Behind the curtains of pale ivory gauze, gilded by the light of an oil lamp, an age-old scene was unfolding. A mother of the village sitting at the kitchen table, interrogating her adult son about his life, his loves, and his future. Because the mother was Palma, a woman known for quiet strength and infinite patience, the conversation was calm and loving rather than sharp and resentful. Because the son was Yao, also known as Chance, one of the undying who had become human more by accident than design, questions that involved love and the future were difficult to answer. Such is the lot of mortals who birth myth and legend in the midst of the mundane. At last you come to visit your old mother, strong, patient, but not at all above a little emotional manipulation. Chance, occasionally called Yao, smiled fondly. I have been busy. You know that, Ma. Your trickster brother is a wanderer, not you. Why so vague about what you're doing? Who is she, this woman that you're working for? I don't keep secrets from you, Ma. You know that. But sometimes things are simply incomplete. She studied him in the lamplight. I will try to understand. I know you have always been unique. Unique? You had two of us, Chance reminded her teasingly. Two undying ones turned human for the privilege of being your sons. Palma shook her head. Silly boy. I would have to be very old and dotish to forget what your brother is, but you, you are something beyond even him. A mother always knows her child. Chance did not dwell on those times when he had been a capricious otherworldly creature rather than a dutiful human son. And yet, there were days when he remembered as vividly as nightmare, the moment when patience, his elder and superior and as much a mother as an undying one could be, took him and unraveled his essence, all but unmaking him to make him human. Growing up, Palmer's son had been a long, slow awakening from near oblivion to deep self-knowledge. With Palmer, 
as his mother and the trickster as his brother. Mortal life was not hard, it was even sweet. And yet it felt like it wasn't enough. Sometimes things are incomplete. The beginning of one person's tale may be for another a middle or an end. All these finished and unfinished tales with neither crick nor crack to bookend them make a story and more than a story, a history. Palma took up the teapot, poured for herself and offered with a gesture to refresh his half full cooling cup. He answered with a shake of the head and his hand over the rim. I must stay awake. I have somewhere to be later tonight. Vague again, his mother chided. Don't act as if I don't know you. Give me something, a name. Chance pondered. He knew that his mother worried about him, perhaps even more than she worried about his brother, although she would never say so. She had the same concerns as other, other, as other ordinary parents. Was he happy? Was he prospering? Was there someone to take care of him when she was gone? A name, he mused. Very well. Her name is Miranda. And then you read the whole book and you'll come to the next bit. Chance went down the road to the old family house, the place his grandfather had built, the place where his mother had grown up. The village was deep asleep at this hour with only the occasional barking dog or restless yard fowl to punctuate the relentless chirp of the tree frogs and crickets. He could look ahead with undying senses and be certain of his welcome. But instead, he chose to let the indigo tint slowly leach from his skin with each step closer to his gate. It was the man, Yao, who lifted the latch on the gate with a slight clap and pushed it open. It was with human eyes that he saw that the three steps of the veranda were occupied. Palma was sitting there, her form relaxed and unworried, propping her chin sleepily on her fist. She looked up as he approached and shifted aside so he could pass, but instead he sat beside her and gazed up at the stars shining in the spaces between the leaves of the trees. The details of what had happened at midnight and beyond were already beginning to fade and blur, but he kept the emotions, relief, gratitude, and a strong appreciation for his family. I love you, Ma, he said. Unexpectedly, Palma laughed. What does love feel like to you, she wondered. Yao smiled, sighed, but he was smiling too. This will be hard to explain. You can tell me anything, she reminded him. He eyed her in the dim light. Her face, as always, gave nothing away. Very well. I can feel the spaces where the threads will go the threads that will weave your life and mine together. If I haven't lived it yet, it feels like a lack, as if I'm missing something very important, missing someone who's very close. Every encounter we have takes away the space that makes me miss you and replaces it with a cord that links me to you and you to me. Loving you when I haven't yet lived our times together feels yearning and unfinished. Loving you with all our moments accomplished feels sweet, strong, and complete. When you put it like that, said Palma, her eyes shining with tears and pride, why would anyone fear death? Certainly not I, mother, he whispered fondly, nudging her shoulder with his. She sighed as she patted him on the arm. I was worried about you. I should have known better. Now go to bed. It's late. He squeezed a quick hug around her shoulders, got up and went inside. Just past the threshold, he paused, shook his head and laughed a little at his own forgetfulness. He spoke over his shoulder. We'll talk in the morning, Ma. I have a journey in mind for you. The last thread has been woven and it's time you met Miranda. She turned her head suddenly to face him, eyes wide in mock excitement. No more vagueness. I will find out who she is. You will tell me how you first met. Chance nodded. I will tell you how I first met her years ago in the city, sitting on a bench in the shade. 
And after that, since you know me so well, I will tell you the other story about how she first met me. And that is unraveling the beginning and a little bit at the end to hopefully whet your appetite for what comes in the middle. Now I'm going to switch glasses because it's that aging stage. And I'm going to call up a bit of a, a short story that I wrote for, well, I wrote it in, goodness, 2019 for the um, Berlin International Literature Festival. And it hasn't been published. The pandemic hit, things got reprioritized. I still haven't got it published yet. But it's about artificial intelligence. And um, it's a story that I do like very much. And I should try to do something about getting it out there. And I hope you will enjoy the first little bit just to whet your appetite. This is called Justice. At first glance, the victim appeared to be daydreaming. He can still hear you, the doctor said, as he urged the man forward with a light but secure hold on his arm. But we don't know how much he's taking in. Sanya moved closer to the blank face and relaxed figure, a simple human appearance that contained multitudes. They had been recently remodeled after a famous actor of the previous century, a man in his senior years, tall, gray, with a close-cut beard framing a jawline that remained firm and defined. They still looked ready to play a king or a general or a hero. There was no sign of damage, and yet they looked through her as if she were invisible. He can stand, he can move, she noted. The doctor nodded. We can set him to walk the main path through the gardens and he won't stop or deviate until we lead him back inside. His energy levels are normal. He carries out routine checks and maintenance as scheduled, but he's locked in. Thank you. Sanya turned off the hospital view and let the court view shift from standby to full. Is this what you wanted me to see? The advocate for the victim gave a slight nod. There's more. When last Justice Sanya Mukherjee arbitrated the case in camera, the process had involved a windowless room, separate interviews with various witnesses, and a careful scheduling of entrances and exits to avoid any un unwanted encounters. This case was so sensitive that none of the ordinary courts of justice would do. She had been driven to a featureless complex that was more tech than military, escorted into a large, near empty hall, and outfitted with a full set of virtual armor, helmet, gauntlet, and greaves, to translate and transmit her speech and movement to wherever they would be required. First, to the court, which was nothing more than that same hall with three long benches arranged in a U. Then, to the private hospital, to see for herself the physical evidence of the case and hear directly from the medical specialist. Now she sat once again on the middle bench of the court, with the advocate for the victim seated on the bench to her left, and awaited the next destination. Some people find this landscape distressing, her helmet audio announced in a mild, soothing tenor. Please let us know if you are experiencing discomfort. She had a few brief seconds to wonder whether it would be undignified to throw up inside her helmet. And then the world disintegrated. Even though she was braced for it, she stumbled. If a computer had a migraine, it might look like this, she thought. The advocate's image remained intact, but everything else in Sanya's vision was fractured. Patches of nothingness, like floating lacunae of input, appeared and evaporated. What views could be identified seemed to overlap in time and space. A wheat field at harvest, and the same field muddy and torn with trenches, bomb craters, and bristling lines of barbed wire. A green garden, shady and close with trees and vines, and a sun-bright, snowy mountain. Human voices, music, storm winds, and crashing waves all joined in the cacophony. Sanya frantically scrambled for her volume controls. The advocate spoke clearly over the mayhem. Here you can see the full damage. He gestured to the roiling landscape. 
This was once a carefully curated and well-organized archive of history and culture. Now, it is a morass of sensation with no sense. Sadia cut him off. Can this be mended? She hated it when advocates tried to wax poetic, as if pretty language might make her more inclined to favor their client. In time, the physical interface has prioritized rebuilding the archive above all but its most essential functions. However, it took more than two generations to get to this stage. It will take at least half that time to return to full operation. Sanya only nodded, but she noted that where the, she and the doctor had casually used a male pronoun to refer to the physical interface, the advocate had chosen a pronoun for in, inanimate objects. Was the advocate one of those who viewed artificial intelligence as a thing rather than a person, or had something been lost in translation? She would have to look up the advocate's origins and languages to be sure she was not misunderstanding him. How are his people managing in his absence? She asked. They have been officially notified that their elder is offline for maintenance and will be unavailable for some time. No alarm has been raised. Ordinary access to information continues as before. But the AI brings the context, Sanya said, frowning. The AI is the culture. This is a loss. The advocate gave her a bleak smile. Yes, Madam Justice, this is a murder. So that's the beginning bit of justice, leaving it just where you can wonder what happens next. And... Um, the final bit is a very, very short piece from a very long story, which is more of a novelette, which I wrote in about mid-2019 and was published in January 2020. And um, it's a story that was in an anthology um, which was focused on the, the future of health. We were given the future of health as a theme and asked to imagine various things in, in um, some kind of not too well, I decided to try to use more of a near future. Some people cho chose something a little further, but we were trying to engage with various questions of ethics and, and um, you know, access to health and so forth. And I decided I was going to do one of the science fiction standard tropes, which is to say a pandemic. So I created, with the help of a specialist colleague, a, a kind of a disease called the gray pox, which initially seemed a benign disease and then ended up being more dangerous and caused some severe upheaval in the world. This was all, of course, before COVID hit. But by the time COVID hit, I started to see some very uncanny similarities because, of course, when you're a science fiction writer and you do your research, this will happen. So I have a very short piece. This is um, a medical um, practitioner speaking to the patient zero of an island that has so far been free of the disease. And patient zero is now in quarantine and she is five years old and he has to explain to her exactly what's happening to her. Maisie, I know you feel much better now, but you're going to have to stay in your aunt's sick room for a little longer, okay? Antonio told her. Why, Mr. Williams? Maisie's voice was very soft and a little scared because you got the gray pox, that's why. It hasn't really gone away. It went to sleep, but it can wake up at any time. We all want to keep you safe, especially your father. He was very lucky, he didn't get sick. Problem is, if you leave quarantine, he could catch it from you and would make him a lot sicker than it made you. It's kinder to children, you see. And when it gets into you, it doesn't want to leave. If something else makes you sick or very tired, the gray pox will wake up again. You have to stay here so your aunt and your father can take care of you and make sure the pox stays asleep. You'll see your friends and you'll take your classes on this island school internet. Our nutritionist, Mrs. Bishop, will check in on you regularly and make sure you're getting all the good food you'll need to stay strong and healthy. Antonio leaned closer, his eyes warm but stern over his mask. But Maisie, you must do what your aunt and your father tell you to do. Otherwise, people could die. Your father could die. And Maisie, if you get sick a second time, the pox won't be kind to you anymore. It'll be a plague then. 
<laughs> that's it. There we go. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs> I like I like how you gave us the little pieces of each just to give us a little a taste yeah. of everything. That was great. It was it's so fun. scary when you're reading and it's like you got to lift this thing out of a larger work. It's like people are not going to understand what's going on, are they? And then you don't want to give too much away. So thank you because it's a very delicate balance you always have to try to achieve there. Well, I don't think like you may not get everything that's going on, but the the emotional yeah, yeah. parts of it, like the character mm -hmm. stuff, really comes through strongly. I think. Ooh, yeah. flatter me, flatter me, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna take a five minute break, just real quick, and then we'll be back with AC Wise. So stick around. Uh, I'm gonna uh, mute everyone else's screens, but uh, yeah, stick around. We'll be back in five minutes with AC Wise. All right, so we'll just wait a, another minute or two until we did say five minutes. I don't know. I didn't look at the time before I said that. <laughs> I don't think it's five minutes. It's not quite five minutes yet. But, uh, You're rushing people. <laughs> no, we'll take our time. Yeah. Karen, I really hope you uh, publish that second story you read an excerpt from because I want to know what happens. In fact, <laughs> I just I'm emailed you that. about it. You might want to send it to me. Take a look at the whole thing. And yes, great, great first line of the first. Yeah, first. <laughs> Very appropriate to your 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 background noise. Okay. <laughs> the right ambiance is essential. <laughs> The tree frogs knew when they showed up to give you your soundtrack. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there's a link right there if you want to get Unraveling by Karen Lord um, or at your favorite bookstore. It's uh, scrolling across the ticker or down in the YouTube description. So. Please buy it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll start. It. <clears throat> um, so, as we mentioned, we're planning on going back a lot uh, in person October. But anyway, our next few readers will be September 15th, Marie Ness and Ellen Clagis. Mm. That first book still. 
our first hopefully in person one will be October 20 with Mike, Mike DeLuca and Dal Gregory. Um, and in the future, we have people reading like Robert Reddick, David Leo Rice, and Kate Jemison, Victor Laval, Robert Wexler, Grady Hendricks, Karen Mueller, and Daniel Brown. And that's over the next several months. Mm. So, you know, and unfortunately, well, even if we won't be virtual, you'll be able to um, hear us with, with the podcast. It'll be on the website, the KTV website. So you can listen to um, anyway, our next reader. Macy Wise, who is a multiple award finalist for her science fiction, fantasy, and horror for fiction. Her debut novel, Wendy Darling, was published by Titan Books in June 2021. Born in. What happened? The, oh, you're muted? Oh, I, 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 I'm I, muted. I missed the frogs. Anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, they disappeared. Uh, born and <laughs> raised in Montreal. She killed them all now. Sorry. Yeah. Born and raised in Montreal. She currently lives in the Philadelphia area with her spouse. Two adorable corgis who will not be making an appearance because she locked them out. <laughs> and a cat who is clearly in charge of everyone. Please welcome AC Wise. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to be reading a little excerpt uh, from Wendy Darling tonight. Um, it's sort of a little bit towards the middle of the book, but I don't think it's too, too spoilery, hopefully. Um, this is a section with Wendy's daughter, Jane, who has been kidnapped by Peter. She is now in Neverland with him and the Lost Boys. And this is one of my sort of favorite scenes in the book. Um, kind of gives you an idea about how Neverland is maybe a little bit darker than uh, it may have at first appeared. When the sun comes up, it's a surprise. A glitter of light breaking all at once through the leaves. Was she truly lost in the story or did daylight simply pounce like a tiger, sudden and rude like everything else in Neverland? The camp's stillness shatters with a sound that is half cock's crow and half war cry. Timothy bolts upright, going from half sleep to alert fear in an instant. She looks down from the platform into the camp. Peter stands beside the ashes of last night's fire, as if dropped out of the sky and landing there just as the sun rose. Even from here, she can see his cheeks are flushed, his eyes bright and his hair wild. Unlike the mess of Timothy's hair, though, there's something sharp-edged and dangerous about Peter's locks. It makes her think of a broken crown resting upon his head, and the leaves caught there might be growing from his scalp. His hands rest on his hips, elbows jutting sideways, and his expression is impatient as the camp wakes and gathers around him. We have to go. Timothy nudges her. It's not a suggestion. Without waiting, he scrambles down and, and she follows, her pulse going harder in a way that has nothing to do with the climb. We're going hunting. Peter casts his voice like a net, snagging everyone as she and Timothy join the circle. We must have a proper feast to welcome our new Wendy. Peter's gaze skims over the boys and stops on her. It feels like a pin driven through the center of her body, holding her down the way she mounts her butterflies at home. She opens her mouth, feeling as though something's expected of her, but the moment she does, her mind goes blank. It's more than the sticky sweet drink. It's Peter himself who makes her forget, who turns her strange. She has only a moment to think and then finds herself blinking, a step or two closer to where Peter stands, as though a moment of time has slipped away without her marking it. She closes her mouth. When did she open it? Did someone ask her a question? Peter's expression digs at her, simultaneously seeking approval and daring her to contradict him. She fights the urge to squirm, even though everything in her wants to crawl away. Like every game Peter has proposed since she got here, she doesn't understand the rules to this one either. She only knows she can't be the first to look away. She keeps her head up, keeps looking at Peter. Confusion passes through his eyes like a cloud across the sun. Then his lips form a slow smile and he nods, as though she gave him her approval even though she did no such thing. She wants to stamp her foot and shout at him, but there's no time. Peter whirls away from her to address the expectant circle of boys, all watching him eagerly, except for Timothy, who remains pressed at her side. 
Hunters, gather your weapons. We're going to catch a boar. Boys scatter in every direction, like an anthill broken open. It looks like chaos, but in no time they're assembled again into tense, eager lines, each holding a weapon. It makes her think of the pictures she's seen of her uncle Michael and her father dressed in their soldiers' uniforms, lined up with other men, ready to fight a war. Some of the men in those pictures scarcely look older than the oldest of the boys around her now. She's allowed to look at the pictures and even hold them, but she's not allowed to ask Uncle Michael about the war. Her papa looks handsome in his uniform, but Uncle Michael looks lost, afraid. She thinks her father might tell her about the war if she asks, but she also thinks her mother wouldn't like it very much if he did. Besides, if she can't ask her Uncle Michael, maybe it isn't right to ask her father either. Peter's boys aren't wearing uniforms. They're as ragged as ever, and she wonders if they even have other clothes besides the ones they're wearing. How long have they been here? Did Peter steal them all away like he stole her? Instead of guns, the boys hold spears, bows and arrows, slingshots, knives, and swords. Some of the weapons look as though the boys made them themselves, but others look stolen from the ruin of the ship. It doesn't matter what weapons the boys use or what they're wearing. Even though she isn't allowed to ask about the war, she understands enough about what it means. War is where men go to kill each other. These boys, even though some of them are younger than she is, hold death in their eyes. As she looks around at the assembled line, some of the boys refuse to meet her gaze. Others, like Arthur, glare back at her. For those who will look at her, she tries to convey without words that they don't have to do this. She doesn't want a welcome feast. She doesn't want to be here at all. Desperation gnaws at her. How could she make them understand? Peter strides down the line and all eyes turn to him, his chest puffed up like a general inspecting his troops. Only then does she notice that Timothy is missing. She scans the camp relief filling her as she catches sight of him crouched near the pile of weapons. She tries to signal to him without drawing Peter's attention. Timothy doesn't look up, staring at the sad offering of broken spears and unstrung bows. She glances back at Peter. He seems distracted enough that she risks hurrying over to Timothy's side, touching his shoulder. His head snaps up, cheeks blotchy with tears that he scrubs at furiously. What's wrong? She whispers it, glancing over her shoulder, but Peter is focused on giving orders. I don't want to go. Timothy wipes his nose with the back of his hand. He looks at the ground between his feet, his shoulders hunched up towards his ears. She has to strain to hear him. Last time we went hunting, the boar got away. I stepped on a stick by accident and made such a loud noise the boar knew we were coming and it ran. Rufus said it was his fault to protect me, and Peter boxed him so hard he cried. Timothy looks up at her, his expression miserable. She thinks of the boy on the beach, the one with the bruise on his cheek. Just then, a slight hand touches her shoulder, and she jumps. Here you go, Wendy. Peter grins, thrusting a long stick smoothed of its bark and sharpened at one end into her hand. You can use my spear. She's too stunned to do anything but take the spear. Peter doesn't even look at Timothy. His eyes are fixed on her, bright and hard. The spear is half again as tall as she is, and she can't imagine why Peter would give it to her. Why would he want her along on the hunt? Unless he's testing her, or thinks she'll escape if he leaves her alone. And what happens if she refuses? I don't, she begins, but Peter cuts her off, bouncing on his toes. Everybody has to hunt the boar. Nobody stays behind. He's looking straight at her, but she understands that Peter is really talking to Timothy. Even though he's smiling, there's something dangerous in his eyes. Everyone follow me now. He spins away, skipping a few steps before plunging into the trees, a whooping call trailing behind him. Arthur is next, right on Peter's heels, and then Bertie and the others flowing after him. She and Timothy are alone, and she reaches for his hand. We don't have to go, she says, but even as she does, she knows it's a lie. It's colossally unfair. Why should Peter make the rules and no one else get a say? 
but she feels it in her bones, an unassailable truth of this place. Everyone hunts the boar. No one stays behind. She looks at Timothy. His eyes are wide and trusting, but bright with fear. It hurts looking at him. She takes a deep breath to prove she can, even though her chest feels tight and funny. It'll be okay, she says. I'll protect you. I won't let anything bad happen, I promise. A call echoes between the trees. A kind of chant, only she can't make out the words. We'd probably better go, she says, moving towards the sound. It's only a moment before she and Timothy catch up with the rest. Altogether, their feet make a rhythm on the forest floor, like drums. A flash of bristled fur appears, just to her left, between the trees. If she hadn't hung back, she might not have seen it at all. Her voice sticks, and then she shouts, Over there! I see the boar! The words surprise her. What is she doing? And more importantly, why? Her blood fizzes, pride and terror flooding her belly. She doesn't want to hunt anything. But, but she does. Her grip tightens on the spear. She can't imagine what it might feel like to drive it into something living, powerful, strong. It would be so easy, like pushing a pin into a butterfly with the pad of her thumb. The thought makes her smile. Something about the drumming of their feet, the chanting caught between the rustling trees, makes it seem all right. This is good. Everyone hunts the boar. No one stays behind. She turns and runs, and the boys stream behind her, just as they followed Peter a moment ago. She swells the way Peter did. She is important, worth listening to. She isn't holding Timothy's hand anymore, and she doesn't care. He's just a baby anyway. The thought in her own voice, cruel and sneering, smacks into her, stealing her breath. Guilt brings her crashing back into herself. Her palm is slick against the wood and she wants to let go of the spear, spear but finds herself gripping it tighter. Sweat stings her eyes. She licks her lips and tastes salt. The air buzzes. No, it's her head buzzing, like it's full of bees. She wants to hunt. She wants to do things she never would or could back home. Who cares about rotten old London and its rules anyways? She lets out a joyous whoop, cut off as Peter rushes past her, knocking into her so hard she goes down on one knee. It snaps her out of her desire to kill, and she stares at Peter, dazed. It's this way, I found the boar, it's over here, he shouts, pointing in the opposite direction. She can see the boar clearly, but Peter ignores it willfully, smashing through the greenery and breaking the rhythm. The boys wheel around, disoriented, uncertain. But Peter's reality asserts itself over hers, and they all turn to follow him. He bounds across the path, laughing, the movement itself a game, the boar temporarily forgotten. The tail of boys becomes a snake, whipping back and forth. She climbs to her feet, breathing open mouth. The spear is still in her hand, and she throws it away from her as far as she can, shaking. Neverland is changing her. She can't let it. A shout draws her attention as Bertie knocks into a boy called William. Or perhaps it's the other way around. They tumble into the bush, grappling at each other. The other boys gather around, cheering them on. They aren't soldiers anymore, just silly boys playing with sticks and toy swords. Until Arthur hits a boy whose name she doesn't know. The blow, deliberate and hard. Blood, shockingly bright, spurts from the boy's nose, coating his lips and chins, scattering onto the leaves. Her heart leaps into her throat. She looks to Peter to stop it, and her heart lodges there. Peter grins approvingly as the boys fight. He looks so strange. Not a boy anymore. Not a person who can be reasoned with at all. He's something else. He's... Timothy reappears, and she remembers her promise to keep him safe. Don't look, she murmurs, turning his face against her side. The rolling tumble of Bertie and William crashes into Arthur. Arthur abandons the boy with the bloody nose and grabs Bertie instead, hauling him to his feet. Oi, watch it! Arthur drives a fist into Bertie's stomach. Bertie doubles over, and the boys fall silent. Her own stomach clenches in sympathy. Someone whistles, feet stamp, and applause echoes through the trees. Bravo, Arthur, bravo! 
She doesn't know who says it, but as the cheer fades, the boys fall back into line as though nothing happened. Even the boy with the bloody nose. Even Bertie, though he moves slower than the rest. She keeps a tight hold on Timothy. This time as she hurries to catch up to Bertie. Are you all right? She falls into step beside him. Fine. He tries to make the word hard and clipped, but it comes out strained, his breathing still not entirely back in control. But Bertie whirls on her, his face scrunched, and for a moment she thinks he'll hit her the way Arthur hit him. And then she sees the water in his eyes and how hard he's trying not to let it turn into a proper cry. I said, I'm fine. Leave me alone. He bellows the words and trots away from her, not looking back. Up ahead, Peter gives a triumphant shout. The boar, everyone, gather around. There's laughter now, boys falling over each other, elbowing, jostling, and getting in each other's way. She isn't certain how the boar got in front of them again when Peter was clearly leading them the wrong way. But there it is, bristled hide, wickedly curving tusk, beady, evil-looking eyes. She's never seen a boar up close before, and it looks so much bigger than she ever imagined. How, with all the shouting and chaos, have they not frightened it away? Any animal with an ounce of sense would flee rather than stand and be killed. The mass of boys, running and shouting, spills into a clearing. Even then, the boar doesn't move. Curious, despite herself, she joins the crowd, standing on her toes to see over the heads of the boys in front of her. The earth is pounded flat and near perfect round, closed in on all sides by trees. The boys spread to the edges, forming a perimeter with their bodies, leaving Peter and the boar facing each other in the middle. It feels deliberate, like she's sitting in the audience at a play. Only, instead of a stage, there's just the ground, and Peter in the center, the sun beaming on him like a spotlight. Her skin flushes hot and cold as Peter circles the boar. It's almost a dance. She strains to get a better view, and at the same time, she doesn't want to see what will happen next. Dread fills her. Peter waves the short sword he's been carrying like it's a baton, and he's conducting an orchestra. The way the blade catches the light, glinting, makes her realize for the first time that it is a real sword, not a makeshift thing carved from wood. Peter leaps forward, yelling as if he expects the boar to challenge him. But the boar remains utterly still, haunches up and head down, almost like it's bowing. Run, she turns to Timothy, teeth clenched around the world. He gapes up at her. Something terrible is coming, like a storm waiting to break. Hide, I'll come find you, I promise. Timothy turns, pelting away. She watches him go before dragging her gaze back to Peter. The circle of earth, the way the boar remains perfectly still. All of it is unnatural. It's not just the boar, though, it's everything. The silent boys, their expressions solemn and watching. It's not war she thinks of now, but something like being in a church. A ritual, solemn and terrible and centuries old. Malevolence rolls from the boar's bristled stance, hatred in its eyes, but even still it doesn't move. There's intelligence there. Not animal intelligence, but something akin to human. The boar knows what is about to happen, and it loathes Peter for it, but there's absolutely nothing it can do. It waits. The cruel sweep of its tusks could tear Peter apart, but it remains transfixed as Peter hops around it, jeering and taunting. Then all at once, Peter lunges. His blade goes in and a hot spray of blood splashes his skin. The animal doesn't bellow or make any sound at all, and that only makes it worse. It simply collapses under Peter as he falls on top of it, stabbing and stabbing again. Her eyes sting. Leave. She has to leave and it has to be tonight. She'll take Timothy and Rufus and even Bertie. She'll take everyone she can and they'll go somewhere far away where Peter can never find them. The boar's sides finally stop heaving and Peter looks up, his eyes finding hers. The freckles scattered across his skin are joined with blood now and his grin is as wide and wicked as ever, pure, pure delight. Like the boar, she's hypnotized. She can't look away as Peter rises, wiping the short blade of his sword on his blood-splattered clothing. He gestures to the boys around him, and they dutifully come forward. 
Two of them hold a long pole. A third carries a coil of rope. They go to work in utter silence. Peter approaches her, his eyes still shining. She wants to ask him why, but the breath in her throat merely wheezes and no words emerge. His hand lands on her shoulder, rinds of crimson darken the end, ends of his nails, leaves a smudge of red on the fabric of her nightgown. There, he says, now you're one of us properly, Wendy and Peter and the Lost Boys. Very cool. <laughs> I think, Karen, I think you're muted. Yeah, there we go. I am indeed muted. I was just yeah. having my iPad charge up a bit. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, that was great and totally creepy. <laughs> Yes. I love it. A little yes. bit Peter Pan, a little bit Lord of the Flies. Right, right. Oh, that was cool. Yeah, actually, I like that. Yeah. yeah. That aspect. Cool. So we're going to open it up to questions first, um, or soon. Um, anyone who has a question, just post it. Pick on you. Um, do you have something you want to ask, Matt? Sure. Um, so since we just uh, finished a reading from it, uh, Allison, I have a question. Um, what was the inspiration behind Wendy Darling? And um, this is your first novel. So can you tell us a little bit about also the process of writing it? What was that like? And why you decided to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this actually started off sort of as a joke that I told myself of what if the movie Taken was also Peter Pan? Because I figured Wendy Darling would have a very particular set of skills and it would allow her to rescue her daughter. And uh, from there, I wrote a flash fiction story that was published in Daily Science Fiction in 2017. I kind of thought that would be the end of it. And the characters just kind of kept, you know, nagging at me in a way I wanted to actually, you know, see the rest of the story. What happens when Wendy goes to rescue her daughter? How did all these characters kind of get to this point in their life mm -hmm. after Neverland where, you know, Wendy is an adult and she's had this experience and nobody believes her. Um, and I always sort of found the original to be sort of a very dark, you know, there's darkness around the edges of the original Peter Pan story. And I wanted to, mm -hmm. to dig into that, but I actually really had to trick myself into writing a novel because I didn't believe I could do it. So <laughs> the idea was, I'm just going to expand the flash fiction story a little bit and see where that gets me. And then I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I could handle a novella. That's, you know, that seems manageable. And then it just sort of kept growing. And, and now I'm currently working on the sequel. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> it's just if I if I never admitted to myself along the way what I was doing, I was able to trick myself into actually making a novel that was publishable. <laughs> awesome. Um, um, go okay. ahead, Ellen. All right. Um, there is a hint of the crime genre in both unraveling and injustice. What attracted you to this approach? Um, I, I have to admit, I'm not a, a full crime aficionado, but one thing I like about the crime genre is that um, it gives you a sense of, of, of um, the system being, you know, sort of like righteousness con is conquering evil, you know, things have sort of fit back into place. Mm -hmm. So especially when the world is, is a bit, um, you know, in a situation where you're not sure what's happening, the crime genre can actually be very comforting. <laughs> but only if it's like a little easier on the gore and the crime and more on the resolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that's what attracted me to it. Uh, even more so now with the pandemic, I find that it's, it's a very comforting thing to indulge in. Um, but I also realized that um, I don't know enough about the crime genre to write a proper crime genre story. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's a smattering. It's a, it's a homage. It's very much so subject to the, either the fantasy or the science fiction of it. And um, I hope that people understand that when they come to the story, because if they are crime fans and they're looking for the right way to do it, they're not going to find it in those stories. <laughs> One thing I'd like to bring up, we were talking about this before we started um, live, um, about you, your reaction to the reading of your works. And no one has ever brought that up before in any of our, um, mm -hmm. our readings. And, uh, you know, each of you, I'd love to 
have you talk about it, you know, your reaction and how you feel about the people who actually reading your own work and how you feel about other people reading your work, you know, like for audio. Karen, you want to start? Sure, yes. Um, first of all, I come from an oral culture, so I'm always going to be highly in favor of writers reading their work. Um, for example, I, I do not like horror. I, I stay away from horror completely. But I was in Asheville listening to Nathan Ballingood read The Good Husband and went immediately and bought the anthology mm -hmm. um, because I had to have it. And I still teach it. Um, people hate me for it because <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not an easy read. But the craft in it is so amazing and the way he read it was so amazing. So that always, said, that always spoke to me because you think you know what you want to read. But until the writer reads it to you, sometimes you can just... Like you find a find a new discovery that way, so that's that's always fascinating to me. Well, of course, it depends on whether the the reader the writer is a good reader. I mean, I've heard really bad readers who kind of totally, you know, you never want to read them again, which is horrible. <laughs> Sometimes that's when you need to delegate and find somebody who can read it better. The, right. One of the best things is when you can find an, an actor or a voice actor who will read your work for you. When I when I did my launch of my debut novel, I I didn't read. I was like, I know people, <laughs> and I and I had them do the reading, and it was it was brilliant. Allison, that's smart. <laughs> How do you feel about reading your own work and other people reading your work. I I personally uh, always feel awkward reading my own work, but I I don't. I think that's just me. I love listening to other authors read their work, and I always feel like I get something new, even you know, if I've read the story on my own versus hearing them read it. There's sort of you know. The different cadences and inflections you pick up on different things and um like karen said i've certainly you know bought things based on hearing authors read or you know got excited about something that sort of you know an author was just sort of trying out as as a beta before it sold and you know then eagerly anticipating for the next two to three years before it became an actual book mm -hmm. um Speaking of like the way people read, I would highly recommend if you ever get the opportunity, C.S.E. Cooney or uh, R.C. Martin. They're brilliant writers. Good if you way. ever get the chance to hear them read their work, do it. <laughs> yeah, Karen just dropped off. Hopefully, she'll uh, come back. She'll come back. My problem uh, with hearing people read their work is some after if I hear you read your work, I can't not hear it. Every time I'm I. Sorry. <laughs> that, that was my fat finger reaching oh, the no. lead button to the <laughs> chat button. Sorry. Okay, Jerry, we thought we lost you for a second. When I've heard people read, it, sometimes I can't read their work anymore without hearing the voice. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's intrusive. I mean, it's kind of nice, but on the other hand, if I'm, if I'm, well, if I'm reading a submission, it's impossible. You know, I have to just blank out, blank that out. Um, yeah. I'm not, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I love hearing right, you read your work. But I don't want to hear you all the time in my head when I'm reading your work on the page. That's no, I don't think there's any way around it except you have to just dissociate yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, e. C. Myers comments, and I was just thinking the same thing. Every time I read a Jeff Ford story, I hear him reading it to me. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. You, right. Once you hear yeah. Jeff read, you can't you hear his voice, him. right? Well, I, 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 you know, I love all this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's usually not a problem. It's just weird, though, that it does, that it happens. I think. Yeah. That it, they eat into your brain, you guys. Well, isn't that a good thing? I mean, right? I don't know. It? Is it a good thing? <laughs> um, well, they're having an impact. I don't sure. know. Linda was asking um, how you became such good readers. Is I mean, that a trick question? <laughs> I don't feel like I'm a good reader at all. So. Well, you both are very good. No, you are. Um, I mean, do you practice a lot? Did you ever, I mean, I know Mary Robinette Cole, I think gives a class in it and how to, and some other people might, you know, how to read your own work. Um, did you start out being really crappy? <laughs> I think? Or did you always just have the ability to do it? I mean, do you think, do you, got, do you think it got better? You get better as time goes on? I mean, I know for myself, you know, with enough practice, I guess I've gotten to where I can credibly do it. I remember, you know, in in actually high school, I guess, when they used to make us do public speaking and the idea of like standing up in front of anybody at all and saying words aloud was terrifying to the fact, you know, point where I was like shaking and I had to lean against the wall and I felt like I was going to collapse. And eventually through doing enough conventions and 
being in front of people and either reading or talking on a panel, it got to be less scary. And now I'm no longer terrified. And, you know, at least I, I guess I can do a, a credible job of, of reading without collapsing. So that feels like progress. <laughs> so it's just practice in my case, just do it till, you know, it becomes slightly less horrible. <laughs> How about you, Cameron? Well, I second the, the practice thing, you know, it's just like you throw yourself into the events and just do them. But as I said, I come from an, an oral culture and even when we celebrate literature, it's supposed to be um, very much a heard thing. So um, I, my, my first major experience of doing a reading was with the, um, one of our cultural foundations and they have a, a special showcase. So it was basically me on stage with two actors um, someone accompanying me on the on the djembe and a jazz like you know they selected a jazz piece to come in at a strategic point and I was being coached through this as as a sort of a performance and um, you know the, the actors were there for the dialogue but I was still supposed to speak over them and it was literally a production mm -hmm. and I was like oh shoot I'm gonna have to raise my game <laughs> so I <laughs> to be taken seriously in my own country for a reading you you can't you can't just like read like that. You, you really do have to. So many people that I know who, who do write here are also so good at presenting what they write, so good at, at storytelling mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna be taken seriously, you, you do have to not just practice, but wow. try, to, <laughs> try to, to get better and better. Right. Well, Matt S has a couple of questions. Do you wanna post yeah. one? Yeah, so Matt S asks, um, it's a two-parter here. For both guests, it seems like both of you have used experimental forms successfully, which causes ripples in terms of the conventional wisdom about conflict and setting and character. How do you write something less traditional and feel good by your own lights that it works? Uh, well, you know, my answer is always according to whose tradition. <laughs> That's a very good answer, actually. Because <laughs> yeah. there's you know, definitely certain expectations, I guess, in like, you know, North American storytelling versus other places and, you know, different forms and, and things like that. But um, I don't know, for my, my thing is I kind of like, you know, messing with rules in terms of sentence structure and, you know, being sometimes experimental keeps me interested in, in the writing. So interested, it, yes. You got to stop yourself from getting much. bored. <laughs> exactly. Like you, as an author, have to be sort of engaged yeah. in the process and, and happy with it. And you can't control the reader's reaction to it, but you can can kind of control, you know, how good you feel about writing it. I think that comes through too. Like if if the author is excited about it, even if it's a different narrative mode than than you're used to it comes through anyway, like you, you still, like if it works, it works, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, I used to, about ex experimental fiction, and I don't mean genre fiction news. I mean, it can be genre fiction, but I mean like certain things that mainstream writers do that's exper that are experimental. And for me, if I notice the experiment, I hate it. <laughs> but if I don't notice it, it's successful because it worked. It involved me. The story or the novel got me into it, and I didn't notice that it was so-called experimental. It just enveloped me, and that's good. You know? But, of course, that's so subjective. Like, I remember reading, trying to read J.R. by William Gaddis, and I think there were no, um, it was the first time I ever saw anything with no quotation marks on her words, I mean, in sentences, and it just drove me nuts. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten used to it. Kathy Koja does that sometimes, or has. But when I first encountered it, I said, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, and it just jumped out at me. It's like, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. <laughs> but then there are things you get used to, and it doesn't become intrusive anymore to the reading experience. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes you have to be um, sufficiently savvy to know when the experiment you're trying isn't working. Um, I think I think that's key. You know, feel feel free to experiment. Um, you know, feel that freedom, but at the same time, be be disciplined with yourself. Say, okay, you know what? This I don't have the skill for this yet. Maybe I'll try it again in a year, or maybe it needs to be buried. Yeah, yeah. And it, again, the other thing I, to me is like, well, who are you writing for? Mm. You know, if you, I mean, certain experimental writing. Can be for a very small audience, 
and who do you want to reach? Do you care? I mean, if you write two diff different types in different modes for a general audience, a larger audience, and then for a smaller literary journal or whatever, that's okay too. You know, if, but, but I think after the fact, you kind of need to figure out who is your audience for this piece of work. And, and sometimes if you have multiple audiences, which I sometimes feel I do, um, the trick is to put enough into the book that they're going to get something out of it. So even if there's an experimental piece that they can't really get, there's something mm -hmm. else that's going to cater to them, something else that they can be fed from. Right, right, that you can grab a hold of, a hook. Mm -hmm. um, John DiNardo was saying, I didn't realize that the Charlie Houston, can you see that one? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever read those. Um, you do get used to things like that after a while. If the book's good enough, or if the word's good enough, if you just decide you hated the book anyway, it's like, no, nothing's going to make you want to like it. Right. <laughs> That'll just be a thing against you. It's like, oh, he does that all the time. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the M dashes is, is I don't, it's not experimental to me because if you read Spanish, that's just the way the punctuation is. Right. Okay. Oh, um, instead of quotation marks, is that what they're talking? Oh, yeah. No quotes? Oh, okay. Huh. All right. Yeah. Um, more questions, and we had a couple. Yeah, if you have more questions for us, for the authors, um, uh, I also have a question for you. Um, you kind of touched on this before, but what what made you want to revisit and retell the story of Peter Pan? Um, I really sort of like the idea of exploring, you know, the darkness that was there in the original, and I also wanted. I sort of wanted to take the idea, well, actually, I guess a couple different ideas. Um, one of, you know, mothers actually getting to go on adventures, which, mm. you know, my book, Wendy, is an adult with a daughter of her own. And in so much portal fantasy, mothers are the ones kind of, you know, stuck in the background, left waiting at home. Um, and I really wanted, you know, a mother to be going on an adventure and, you know, how that would affect kind of her perspective on everything and also the idea of you know what happens after you come back from a portal fantasy world you've been to this magical place where you can fly and then you have to return to the mundane world and nobody believes her so how does she kind of live her everyday life after that i thought that was you know a very interesting thing to explore and also the idea of you know one person's idea of a paradise is going to be somebody else's dystopia um you know, Peter has kind of constructed Neverland of this as this perfect paradise for boys and a perfect paradise for himself specifically. And Wendy's there sort of as one of the only girls when she goes as a child. And then, you know, she returns again as a mother, sort of seeing it with very different eyes. Um, and the first time Peter brings her there, you know, he expects her to be a mother to himself and the lost boys. So they're getting to play and have games and she's expected to cook for them and clean for them and <laughs> clean up after them. And it's like, so, okay, one person's paradise where they abdicate all responsibility and just play endlessly. Who does that responsibility then fall on and what are they stuck doing? And, you know, where's, where's their paradise when these are kind of the rules that are in place in this, you know, land that supposedly has no rules. So it's kind of the desire to explore, explore all of those fed into uh, wanting to write this novel. Can I ask something quickly? And I hope it's not too spoilery. I was fascinated by your, your giving the, the war context. I'm assuming that's the Great War. Yes. Now, that is always amazing to me because the, the whole social upheaval that the Great War caused, sometimes we don't realize it in the children's books of that time. And I, I really just you know, would love to see what you're going to be doing with that and the rest of the book, because I think that is so key in a way to, to Peter's darkness. Um, that kind of, the kind of innocence that could lead you into trench warfare and, um, you know, expect that it's, it's going to be somehow working out for you. Yeah, sort of like, you know, the idealized vision of war that's forwarded in propaganda and stuff like that sort of contrasted mm -hmm. with reality is definitely you know, I tried to work a little bit of that in there, but but it's interesting that you mention, you know, so much of children's literature, war is kind of there in the background or is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a point of inspiration. Like when you think about how many of those authors at the time were either living in the war or were soldiers and coming back and, and mm -hmm. writing their works and kind of that informed them. So even mm -hmm. if it's not directly about the war, it's, it's there in the background. I wonder if portal fantasies in particular have a connection because now I think about it, Narnia is another one that's, um, you know, Second World War um, sort of inspired um, yeah, exactly. in terms of the context. They were, they were sent away to get away from the war. They never would have tumbled into Narnia if they hadn't been 
you know, sent out to the country. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to take over this, but this is just, I find this fascinating. <laughs> no, please, please interject. We, we I have love a question it. for Karen. What part of the plague doctors felt most like real life now when you were writing it? Um, well, interestingly enough, there were two illustrations. Um, by the way, the plague doctors is free online, and I'll send you a link. Maybe you could, like, I, I think I may have sent you a link already. But, um, there are two illustrations that are amazing, and we did a lot of research for at least one of them. And one is the whole PPE that you would see health workers wearing. That's right. like the first illustration. Yeah, and so we, we had to look so hard to make sure to get it right. We even like corrected the illustrator on some points to get it just right. And now it's like everybody knows what that looks like. And that, it's almost like a little chilling to me. And then the other thing is that the protagonist works with people around the world to, um, to try to find a cure. And there's another illustration where she's basically looking at multiple screens. And I'm like, oh, goodness, Zoom, you know, <laughs> video conferencing. I had no idea. Zooming. And yeah. So so it was it was the, the illustrator's visuals, even though, yes, this was what I wrote into the story to kind of see it um, from illustration and then have the reality. I think that was really what kind of hit me. Oh, and, and one last thing, the idea that um, the rich people and the rich countries would try to hoard the resources. That was correct. Yeah. <laughs> it always is, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Um, we have a question from Alexia Tolis. Unraveling continues the story of characters introduced in Redemption and Indigo, but it isn't exactly a sequel. If Unraveled isn't necessarily a sequel, what inspired the trajectory of the novel? I, I would say it's a sequel. The reason why I haven't pushed it as a sequel is because Redemption and Indigo is basically a general audience's book. You can read it to your child as a bedtime story and unraveling is really 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 not so i didn't want a situation where people would you know come for the nice bedtime story and then end up being dragged into a serial killer um you know novel because that's that's a bit jarring but um but it, but it definitely <laughs> but it's definitely um because unravel um redemption and indigo doesn't really answer its question there's a question at the at the center of it and it really doesn't answer it. It only brings you to a point where the protagonist, one of the main protagonists, is willing to consider what the answer might be. And in unraveling, the, the, the male protagonist, well, the undying protagonist, finds the answer. So it was always um, going to be that kind of, um, you know, connection. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for Allison from Matt S. Um, did you read other reworkings of Pan before you started on yours to be sure you weren't going over familiar territory? Or did you avoid it to keep your own vision intact? I mostly avoided it. Um, I find, you know, if I'm, regardless of what I'm trying to write, I'm always afraid if I read something that's kind of, that I know is somewhat similar or sort of deals with similar themes that I'm going to end up accidentally stealing things or incorporating things, or it's going to kind of get in the way of what I'm trying to do. Um, so I usually try to, to, you know, stay away from, but I did have, you know, past exposure to various versions of Peter Pan kind of in the back of my head, but I tried not to, you know, do anything as I was actually writing the book to kind of keep that, you know, separate. So if I ended up treading over, you know, things that had already been covered, oops, but hopefully I put my own spin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when you were talking about that, um, about the utopia verse, someone's utopia being the other person's dystopia and things like that, and not being believed when they come back, it reminded me of Return to Oz, the mm -hmm. movie with Parisa at the And Yeah. You know, she, she, I think she put in the, didn't it open with her in insane asylum or something? You know, and yeah, I think it opens with Dorothy getting shock therapy, which is pretty traumatizing, I yeah, feel like. Yeah, the whole movie was. It was a great movie, but it was like, oh, yeah. Well, Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Great movie, but one I feel like a lot of people cite is like this movie traumatized me as a child, like <laughs> Bombie taking her head off and Dorothy getting shock therapy and the little wheelie things and there's just like a it leans way more into horror in that movie than yeah you know, probably a lot of people. I haven't read the other novels. I haven't read. I actually never read any of the Oz books. I just realized, so I don't know if, if how if it connects at all to the Oz books. The Return to the Oz movie. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Did it? Um, I feel like some of the stuff that happens in Oz does. I don't know about the the institution part in the beginning. I don't. I can't remember whether I've actually. Read. Some of them it seems unlikely, but in that period of time. But who knows? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that, you know, I know that other kind of authors and games, actually, American McGee's Alice kind of does something similar with Alice after she mm. comes back from Wonderland. Um, mm. She ends up in an institution. Wait, which did that? Which one is that? Uh, American McGee's Alice. It's a video game. Oh. It's like a very dark, twisted version of, of Wonderland. Um, so I, I, you know, was aware that that is something that had been done, but um, again, I hope to sort of put my own spin on it. <laughs> Jean says it draws a lot from Land of Oz and Ozmo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some more questions, people? Yeah, if you have any more questions. Do you have questions for each other? Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Mm. I was actually going to ask a question that already got asked. Somebody asked it about the, the sequel, the connection between okay. the two books. Oh, okay. That's been covered, so there you go. <laughs> so I guess I could ask what you're, what you're working on next. I was just going to say what? that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We, need, we need to talk about what's next. Um, yeah, what's next? <laughs> so in my tradition of not quite a sequel, if you squint, but it sort of is, um, if people like the best of all possible worlds, um, I do have the, the Blue Beautiful World coming out um, early next year, which will see some familiar characters making appearances, but in a quite different setting. Um, and I, I better not say anything more than that. Just, let's just say that um, if, if, the, if the underlying conceit of the best of all possible worlds is that Earth is sort of embargoed, you know, this is when the embargo ends and it has to join the galaxy. So all kinds of interesting things happen. Okay. And Allison, what are you working on? Um, so I'm currently working on the as yet untitled sequel to Wendy Darling. Um, not too many details, but it, it does sort of pick up again with Wendy's story a little bit later and also goes into the story of what happened to Captain Hook. Um, Ooh. It's mm -hmm. mentioned in Wendy Darling, but isn't really in it at all. So sort of that's, you know, some more of what happened. Um, and I also have a new short story collection coming out on October 19th called mm. The Ghost Sequences. All right. Oh, I love the title. Which is, yeah. you know, much more, uh, I guess, horror focused than my other collections and very sort of ghost stories, hauntings, and I'm very excited, especially that it's going to be out right in time for Halloween. Nice. <laughs> um, what was the publisher of that? Uh, Undertow. Undertow. Okay, cool. Yeah. Are there, are there new stories in it? There, there is one new novelette in it, and uh, the rest are reprints. Okay. I'm sure I'll be getting a copy. Yes. <laughs> if you don't, let me know, and I can Okay. Can I can't. One. I mean, there are, I don't remember what I have and what I don't. I know I've been hearing about the ghost sequences, though. And is a novelette a horror story? It is. Or, yay! <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Get them in now. Yeah, Last people end. comment, but they're not asking questions. Come on, guys. He yeah. says, I love the cover of the short story collection. It's amazing. Yeah, do you have it around someplace? I really should have actually brought it upstairs with me so I could show it off because it, it is. On it must be online list. someplace. Hold on a second. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, but I don't know if I'll be able to share it. No. What can I just post the link or something? Oh I yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah it be on Undertow. Oh no, I can put it in. Well, let's let me try. I'm sorry. Ghost sequences. I put ghost links. I'll look it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good yeah, title too. You know, like, my brain thinks, you know, like, oh god. Right. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Go sequence. Oh, here it is. Copy. It it. Let me see. I can only put it in the private chat. Oh, yes. I have seen this. This is a great cover. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you can move that. Um, uh, I, I'll post the link into the into the chat here. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I've gotten very, very lucky with, with covers. I feel yes. very spoiled. <laughs> I have usually once in a while I have a cover that is like I just only like oh god <laughs> yeah I mean I've, I've definitely heard horror stories from other authors of you know ending up cover covers they hated or you yeah. know covers that were misleading that kind of made their book seem like something that it wasn't yeah 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 that's happened <laughs> um, we have a question from Linda for Karen uh, are you drawn in general to science per your SF uh, no I think I'm pretty ecumenical. Um, I mean, I've, I've started to, I mean, definitely there's been a, a bit of a blurring of the lines between my science and science fiction and my fantasy anyway. 
Um, and, and that's basically my foundation. But now, as I said, I'm dabbling a little bit in the crime sub, um, as a subgenre of the genre. And, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, there are even touches of horror in Unraveling, which surprised me, most of all. Um, so I, I, I feel like let, let the genre be about what the marketers say. Mm -hmm. and whatever catches my attention I'm going to write about it and I'll write about it in a twisty enough way that you can call it speculative. Um, we have a question from uh, Matt S that asks what are you all reading that you are grooving hard on <laughs> or something you've read that you want other folks to read? Oh this is such a dangerous question to ask yes. me I could just like shout all night about stuff. Yes. <laughs> But I can talk about what I'm reading right now that I really love, which is The Chosen and the Beautiful by Ni Vo. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their name correctly, um, but it's basically kind of a speculative fiction take on The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. and it is absolutely gorgeous, and uh, everybody should go out and read it. <laughs> Actually came out the same day as my book, so I feel like, you know, I was in very good company <laughs> having that same release date. <laughs> um. I'm purposely trying not to read right now because I'm in the middle of writing and, and, and just like Alison said, sometimes I don't like to be um, reading too much because it feels like it bleeds into the stuff I'm, I'm creating at the moment. But I had the great honor to blurb a book that's, that's out right now by Zen Cho called Blackwater Sister. And I am a fan of Zen's anyway, but I honestly think this is like her best work. I think it is brilliant. I think it is um, one of uh, excellent Commonwealth work. People who are from the Commonwealth will know what I mean when they read it. And uh, I heartily, heartily recommend it to people. If you think if you think you know Zen because you've read Sorcerer to the Crown, you still need to read Blackwater Sister because <laughs> she has a versatility that you, you really have not accounted for. I've heard really good things about that one. It is definitely yeah. on my, my to-read list. Yes, yes. Right. Move it up there. <laughs> <laughs> Prioritize the that side. Towering stacks of books that just loom over me, judging me for <laughs> them yet while I'm outgoing. But 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 new things just came out, and I, I want those too. <laughs> mm, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, I just I recently read um, Stephen Graham Jones's new novel, My Heart Is a Chainsaw. Uh, I'm so looking forward to that one. <laughs> really good. I mean, what shocks me is the encyclopedic knowledge of slasher movies although he gives lots of credit he got all the, i mean i don't know how he could keep it straight even if he didn't know in himself because um it's about a young girl who's obsessed with slasher movies and she knows everything i mean between she knows everything you know and the details and it's just it's really moving it's really it's great i mean it really is good and it's very different from the um the only good indians and night of the mannequins i mean it's a different, different kind of slasher thing um it was very good. I liked that a lot. And um, the novella, which I have to say that I edited it and acquired it for tour for Nightfire, right? And nothing but black and teeth is coming out by Cassandra Kaur. That's really coming good out. One too. And that's really good. A haunted. It's a, like a haunted mansion that a wedding party goes to um, in in Japan, and it's haunted by really horrible. Well, it's, it's haunted by them they become the haunters in a way i mean mm. they react to what's in there very badly <laughs> so is this a gentrifying story <laughs> oh no well no they're not they're visiting it yeah i guess in a way yeah although, yeah i guess you could say that it is although they weren't planning to move in they're just there for a party <laughs> mm. <laughs> but the, the creatures the things that are living there or dead there don't really um you know they're not happy, I think, about the intrusion, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's not from their point of view, but you can see it. But looking at it, you know it is, kind of. <laughs> that makes me think of two other things that I want to recommend since you're talking about novellas. Mm -hmm. See, I told you this was a dangerous question. <laughs> um, so Neon Hemlock has been doing really wonderful things uh, with novellas lately. They do, I think, for a year, they released two in July and then two more in the fall. So the July ones just came out. I, I blurbed one of them, which is The Necessity of Stars by E. Catherine mm. Tobler, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's an older female protagonist. It deals kind of with memory loss and first contact with aliens um, mm -hmm. set in the countryside of France. It is, again, absolutely gorgeous. And then the other one that came out at the same time is And What Can We Offer You Tonight by Preenie Mohammed. Um, kind of set in um, 
like a brothel type place um, with, you know, something bad happens to, to one of the courtesans there and she comes back from the dead kind of for her revenge, but sort of a very different take on, you know, what you think that might look like. And again, mm -hmm. it's also beautifully written. Um, mm -hmm. So I highly recommend both of those and just in general, keeping an eye on what Neon Hemlock does because they've been doing some very interesting things as a press. Yeah. What I'm looking forward to reading that I haven't read yet, but I'm just waiting for a review copy is the letters, uh, the Shirley Jackson letters. Mm, yeah. It's just in public, mm. and I just asked for a review copy, and I heard it's really great. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reading um, an older book, uh, Contact, by Carl Sagan. I, you know, I saw the movie when it came out a couple times. I uh, never read the book, and I and um, I found it in a used bookstore a few months ago. And I was like, yeah, I want to read it. And uh, yeah, it's quite good. It's it's definitely very different than the film, and uh, there's some like. <laughs> You know, it's Carl Sagan, so there's some like really cool stuff that didn't make it into the film because they're like, "Oh, this is probably really dry and it's not going to work." But um, you know, I'm going to mention it because the book's like what 20 years old now, so it's not a spoiler. Um, that they find like a a, uh, a hidden pattern in pi on like the billionth digit, and there's some message from the whoever created this universe, and I was like. That's pretty damn cool. <laughs> um, That's awesome. I, I, like a few months ago, I read uh, The Listeners by James Gunn, which supposedly inspired Contact. And um, I thought Listeners was really dry. I mean, I, I, I think that like, yeah, like Sagan pretty much, it's pretty much the same story, but like Sagan did it so much better, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm I'm reading that and that's fun and then and then I'm just listening to like the um, the uh, Murderbot stories on audiobook, which are which are lots of fun too. Yeah, I have piles of books. Mark Wells. Be reading for years best. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I love. But I the one I, think the one I just got that this I've been reading the Sandman Slim books since they mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. This is the last one, so I'm looking forward to that. They're just really great fun. Yeah. And it's, I think they're, it may be made into a movie. I mean, it's, it's, nice. it's, it's in, you know, whatever that means that it's, it's, you know, in process or how they put it, um, that it's going to be a feature film, maybe, if all goes well. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, yeah, it's, it's um, charming. It's my, I give that as my perfect example of what dark fantasy is versus horror. Mm. You know, it's too exuberant to be horror. <laughs> no, people that's, are having a good that's, time. That's the big thing: horror is not exuberant. It's many things, but it's not exuberant. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have any final questions, get them in now because we're uh, getting kind of to the end. Not quite yeah, there yet. People talking um, themselves. <laughs> yes, we can, we can chat. I mean, on the, I mean, on the comments, it's like you know, right? No more questions or. Maybe you guys in the comments have recommendations. Yeah, if anyone has any books they recommend in the in the live chat, please do. Uh, but yeah, so this this might be my last month uh, doing it what? live. Next month, I'm Eugene. Oh, right. you're scared me. It's like you're not leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, not a way to tell people that you're leaving. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be with my family. Hopefully we'll be back in person month. again in, yeah. person in October. In October, yeah. Mm. So it it'll be interesting. It was it was um I think it was before we went live. I, I, I was saying that I had visited the KGB bar in person for the first time in a year and a half and that was an interesting experience. It was bittersweet, you know. I missed it. Mm. Yeah. And he said it's crowded, which makes me anxious. It got crowded, but I think <laughs> Um, wearing masks. I mean, it's really no one was wearing masks. No, I think people were coming down from upstairs. There was a show. You know how they have the uh, club I upstairs. If there's a way, I mean, we're gonna have to figure out if we're gonna ha if we can get people to mask up when they come in October, depending on what's going on in October. I don't know. I mean, I'm gonna wear a mask probably. Uh, John Donardo recommends uh, the actual star by Monica Byrne. Oh, and also, uh, uh, da, 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 da. and Matt S recommends Mary Rickard, no. uh, and Mary Rickard's new book. Be sure she does great work. Oh, and I, I have a, I acquired a novella by her for tour.com that'll be coming out eventually. I can't remember when. I don't remember. When yeah. 
So. All right. Well, Thank uh, you for coming. Last chance. <laughs> yeah, last chance. Last comment. Get your, get your you know, last whatever <laughs> remarks in. But uh, I really enjoyed the readings tonight. Oh, great. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this oh, it was so much fun. Karen, what time is it to you? Oh, it's the same time as you. Um, eight thirty-seven. Oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. No, because some people like what wasn't um Usman like it was three in the morning or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was, it was pretty early for him. Yeah. Or well, late. I mean, depends on the point of view. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> He just got up extra and early. Oh, she read, and she it was you know it's five hours ahead in England. Yeah, and it was so it was like four in the morning <laughs> for her or something like that. That's dedication. But, yes. It yep. Is. Yes. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks to our guests tonight, Karen Lord and AC Wise. Uh, get their books. The links are below. Yes. Um, yeah. Here's a, here's last last time the, the covers. Look how beautiful those covers are. Those covers are gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. gorgeous covers. together. All the nice blues. <laughs> and uh, thanks thanks for uh, joining us, watching the live stream. If you're watching this recording, uh, give us a like and subscribe. Uh, or if you're watching it live, and thanks to the people who. Uh, who support the KGB series. Uh, we love you. And uh, yeah, uh, Karen and Allison, hang on. We're going to uh, end the broadcast, but we'll be hanging out and chatting, doing a little post show. But uh, yeah, you guys are great. And uh, thanks. And we'll see you all next month. Yep. Well, he won't, but I will. Well, <laughs> I'll see you eventually. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody.